thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Plein, Head of Wealth Management at Cambridge Trust. I'd just like to remind you that we are recording this webinar. The Gardner Museum heist on March 18th, 1990 remains one of the most fascinating unsolved crimes. Two men dressed as police officers went into the museum, tied up the guards, and proceeded to steal 13 priceless works of art. It took 81 minutes, but the damage was incalculable. There is a $10 million reward for information leading to the recovery of the, these pieces of art, and it is still outstanding. We're so pleased to have Kelly Horn with us today. Kelly spent more than two years researching the heist and her podcast, Last Scene, told the story in 10 fascinating episodes. Kelly is now deputy editor for the Boston Sunday Globe uh, and the ideas section. And she's also the recipient of multiple journalism prizes and has a degree from Wellesley College. It may be that Kelly's interest in Isabella Stewart Gardner was preordained. Kelly believes she was born in the wrong century. Uh, and even in this digital world, she writes longhand and in ink. I believe I see a pen over your left shoulder. Yeah. I don't know if it's a fountain pen. It doesn't look like a quill. So it you're, it's, it <laughs> it's, a, it's a real fountain pen. Yeah. Okay, that was unscripted, everybody. <laughs> it was unscripted. <laughs> um, my desk. So our plan today is that Kelly will uh, make some comments and then we will take some questions from you. And as a reminder, you can post your questions in the Q&A section. As we get started, I'd like to make a final note that Kelly is today representing herself and not WBUR or the Boston Globe. So Kelly, the floor is yours and we're really excited to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a such an honor to join you and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions. People always have many of them. Um, and I thought I would just tell you a little bit about um, really what got me interested in this as a subject to begin with and my way into the story um, as, a, as a journalist first and foremost, but as someone who just had a real curiosity about um, this museum and this crime and uh, perhaps most significantly the woman who, um, who bequeathed it to the city of Boston because she thought that we should all have this to enjoy forever. Um, Isabella Stewart Gardner really was my way in. It, it could well, as Jennifer had said, have been preordained. I found out that this podcast was in the works between WBUR and the Boston Globe. I was working at WBUR at the time. And um, I had just happened to have read many biographies of Isabella Stewart Gardner and her collector, Bernard Berenson. And so I had in my head this kind of, um, uh, not deep knowledge, but just real appreciation for who she was and um, what she built. And um, when, I, when I did get the assignment, the first thing I needed to do was understand what does it mean to have lost priceless works of art? Um, what does it mean to put a, you can put a dollar value on it. At the time, the museum was saying 500 million it's now been revised upward to probably more than a billion. What does that mean though? I mean, uh, to me, that just seems so vast. And so um, I took a, a walk as I often love to do in the Mount Auburn Cemetery and it took me down Oxalis Path to the Gardner Mausoleum. And I'd, I'd been past it, but this was the first time I, I stopped and looked in. And I, I was startled when I looked in because looking back at me was the marble bust of Gardner's um, son, Jackie, who died just before he was two years old. And in that instant, I had a sense of, this is a story not only of loss of these, these works of art, but of loss in itself, of elemental loss, of mother's loss of her child. And, and in fact, this is what drove her collecting. Um, after Jackie died in 1865, Isabella Stewart Gardner became uh, bereft as, as you would, she also had miscarried and a doctor told her she would never have children again. And she went from being this incandescent presence in Boston um, to staying in, in her rooms. And it was on doctor's uh, recommendations that her husband took her abroad on a steamer ship 
it's apocryphal, I think, but uh, it's said that she was carried aboard that steamer ship in 1867, uh, destination Northern Europe, on, uh, on her mattress. I don't know if that's true. Um, but it was while traveling that Isabella Stewart Gardner tapped into the life affirming beauty of art and, and um, it was a kind of redemption. And that's when she began collecting. Before that, she had been um, a music aficionado. She loved, she loved music and she also um, sat in on Charles Eliot Norton's Dante lectures at Harvard. And she um, was already a collector of early volumes of Dante. But coming back from that first trip in 1867 ignited a passion in her that would uh, go on and on and on and ultimately become uh, this incredible collection that she built on the fens, then Swampland um, in uh, 1900 thereabouts. Um, and so, so that told me something, you know, about Gardner, um, who she was and what, what things meant to her. And um, I also saw the construction of the palace, this inside out Venetian palace as her, her bid to vanquish mortality. Um, she left a will as, as I'm sure you have heard that nothing in it be, be changed, be altered, nothing in the museum be changed, be altered. Um, and this was her way of, of, of having something that could not leave her. Um, her child died, her husband died in 1898, just before she uh, purchased the land on which to build what was then called Fenway Court. But this um, stone and stucco monument would, would remain. And so um, we also know, and I found this out in my in my research, that she hired what she thought were the best security guards for her palace. She gave them a shoot to kill order. There's a cartoon that I found in an old newspaper of the, um, uh, around the time when the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre Museum in 1910. Uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner was giving her uh, guards this order to shoot to kill if anyone came into her museum. She imagined that there was this international ring of high-end thieves. Um, so I also wondered what she would have made of the security guards who were on duty the night of the, the, the heist. Um, and as Jennifer said, we know the broad strokes. We know that uh, two men disguised as police officers, you can probably finish this sentence for me, went into the Gardner Museum. Um, and that's just about all we agree on. Um, we, the royal we, the people who've looked at this, because the, the conversation diverges so wildly depending on the theory that you, um, that you ascribe to. Um, and my challenge as a journalist with a story that at the time when I took it on was rounding the corner on 30 years of being unsolved um, and that has been told in so many places in so many ways was how to make it fresh and how to give the listeners something that maybe they hadn't heard, how to surprise, how to build suspense and tension when we um, couldn't expect to be able to reveal where the art is. Uh, although we tried, if you listen to the podcast, you know, we, we dug a big hole in Florida under the watch, watchful and um, unapproving gaze of the FBI. Um, so what I wanted to do was go back to the beginning and the beginning for me was all of the news coverage that happened in the days and weeks and months and even that first year after the heist. Um, because as time passes, certain theories and ideas fall away and um, one version seems to coalesce um, around a story. And that's certainly true with the gardener. So it was very interesting for me to go back and read the early press and to see the names that were floated as potential suspects and to um, read the theories about who it could have been, um, for whom this art was being stolen, what purpose, why did they take what they took? Um, and what was so fascinating was that over time, some of these people were no longer spoken about, but I, I wanted to go back in and, and follow all the names and if only to rule them out, um, follow the leads as far as they would go. And there were some storylines that I thought, this is great, this is gonna take us very far, we're gonna have a whole episode, and they petered out. Others, I didn't expect to make one or, one or more phone calls. I, I thought that after a, a call or two, we could rule it out. It yielded an entire episode. Um, and so 
that were that was the big surprise. And I felt like, gosh, if I'm being surprised by all these theories, um, our listeners will be surprised too. And as someone who also has enjoyed a fair amount of pot boilers, I knew that red herrings would work. And so my goal in um, structuring the entire series, the, the, the 10 episode series, the kind of narrative arc that I wanted to put in place was one where each episode would take you in deep inside a theory, you would meet the central characters of that theory, and then you would leave that episode saying, aha, that's the one, only to have the next episode come along and make you doubt that. Because that was my experience. The experience of reporting this was like whiplash. Um, you know, this must be it. No, this must be it. He must have done it. No, he must have done it. Um, and it was a lot of fun. So um, I suppose we should talk about the art that was stolen. And that was another uh, thing that fascinated me to, tr to try to understand why these pieces? Um, there are some who will tell who will tell you that um, there is a rhyme or reason to this. That the thieves were clearly going for Rembrandt. It's why they took the postage stamp sized etching, um, uh, self portrait of Rembrandt. It's why they took Storm on the Sea of Galilee, a huge painting. Um, it's why they took. It said. Um, Lady and Gentleman in Black, another Rembrandt, and there is suspicion that they also took Hovert Flink's um, landscape with an obelisk, thinking that it was Rembrandt because he had at one time been attributed to Rembrandt. Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt is one of the most stolen artists in the world because he's so prolific, but an artist who wasn't so prolific because he had many, many kids and many, many debts um, was Vermeer. Um, and, and we don't know exactly how many Vermeers exist, but we know that uh, the number hovers around 35, 36, uh, the gardener had one of them. And what this painting represented for Isabella Stewart Gardner was her arrival on the scene of collecting as a major force. Um, it was her first acquisition that um, put her on the map. She outbid the Louvre Museum in Paris. The French were furious that this painting was going to an American woman. And she loved it for its portrayal of um, singing and song, something that she cherished. Uh, some of the other pieces, what a mystery, but each one I think can point to a different suspect and that suspect's motivation. I'm thinking about the Shang Dynasty coup. It is not one of a kind. I have, um, I still have an actually a Google alert on various of these pieces. Uh, just to see if they come up and, and the coup, a coup, just like it will come up every so often on auction somewhere in the world, but not that coup. Um, it looks like a vase. It looks like something you could put flowers in. I always thought that, well, maybe it was stolen because um, someone just liked it and it was just easy to grab. And if you listen to the podcast, you know that's not the case. And I'm happy to um, talk more specifically about that. There is even someone that uh, might have wanted that coup. Similarly, the, um, the bronze eagle finial that was atop a Napoleonic regimental banner, basically a silk flag. The silk flag itself was encased in plexiglass. We know that the thieves tried to get that as well. Uh, there were many screws found uh, several days after the heist in um, a bucket of sand that uh, the museum then had as a fire, uh, I guess, fire stop mechanism. Um, did they try to get the finial and the flag? Did they give up on the flag and just go for the finial? We don't know, but they took the finial. We also know that somebody had declared that he wanted that. Um, and then there are the Degas sketches, which depending, again, everyone has a theory, depending on who you ask, the Degas sketches, which are equestrian scenes, are either a sign of a very sophisticated taste because they are uh, very particular, or they were stolen by someone who really loved to spend time at the tracks. <laughs> um, who knows? And then, of course, there is the um, mystery within this mystery. And again, I'm happy to answer questions about that which is a painting, the only painting that was stolen from the first floor of the museum, uh, Edouard Manet's Chez Tortoni, which uh, was a smallish painting of 
um, a cafe goer with um, sort of beguiling brown eyes and a big top hat looking, looking straight at you. And Shea Tortoni hung in the blue room on the first floor. No alarms were set off in the blue room. Um, it has fueled speculation all these years that the Gardner heist might have been an inside job, someone who was able to get into that room without tripping the alarm, someone who would have had the know-how. Um, and there are other clues that suggest that the thieves weren't going for that Manet, but for the one that was supposed to be hanging above it, which was a portrait of Manet's mother, which was being worked on in the conservation lab, which had a secret location behind a panel in the Dutch room where the theft happened of most of the paintings. Um, there's just a lot to chew on. And um, the podcast last scene uh, doesn't, to my chagrin, uh, go into detail on some of the other theories that we reported, but that we just didn't feel like we had enough uh, to fill an entire episode. Um, those include, uh, was Whitey Bulger involved? <laughs> was the IRA, the Irish Republican Army involved? Um, was there a very wealthy collector in Japan that was involved? There's a whole side, side story about that. Um, but throughout my reporting, when I, it was exhausting and uh, it took me into contact with so many different kinds of people, some of whom I would never have anticipated I'd still be in touch with, um, some of whom broke the law, some who didn't. Um, it's something when an art thief sends you a Christmas card and your husband says, I'm not sure I feel comfortable with him having our address. Um, but it was just um, a wonderful and exciting thing to be able to work on. I honestly wish I could still be working on it. There's still so much more to say. Um, very recently, a detective that I met in Ireland, this is not in any episode, um, who had recovered many paintings over the course of his long career. He had started out at Scotland Yard um, he and I went on a wild ride in the Irish countryside on the trail of a gangster who claimed to know where the gardener's art is. He recently died. And um, it's very poignant, not only because I just loved this man, but um, as more time passes, uh, more memories will fade and more people will be lost. And um, with all of them go the mystery of, of what happened that night in 1990. Um, I'll be happy to answer your questions and I feel like I should stop talking now so that we can get to get to questions. Thank you for listening.